Now we'll set the question um, part of the panel. Our first question is the legacies left by the the, the, the Gacha course, excuse me, <clears throat> were were they effective? Lasting memories, healing and forgiveness, did it happen? Do you want to start, Yvette? The gun the good Chacha courts, were they effective? Did did they create lasting memories? Did they have did they really foster healing and forgiveness? Thank you. Check. Thank you, Dr. Joe. And uh, I first need to convey my very heartfelt sympathy to Costa Rica because I can only imagine what walking on her shoes is like. Even I, as a survivor. So, when we talk about healing, I've heard about Costa Rica's story many, many times, but every time. It's raw. So speaking about healing, I don't think it's abnormal for me to feel the way I feel. Because there was actually a time when I was no longer sensitive to anything. So I think we should, as we feel the pain, we should also celebrate the healing that Tajo is asking about. So Gachacha, as you heard from uh, uh, Zach, Dr. Kaufman, when he was presenting, was the most comprehensive judicial system uh, in the world. Gachacha was like the way you're sitting actually here in the room. See yourselves as uh, witnesses, as uh, uh, observers, and uh, as um, the presumed genocidal and see us sitting here as the judges, the Kachacha judges, except that uh, all of us live in the same neighborhood. All of us lived in the same neighborhood before the genocide. Um, so Gachacha, I remember myself uh, when this idea was introduced, really being so upset, upset with the government. How can you downgrade a such crime like the genocide and come up with these ideas of using something? Again, it's called the grass because it was used for petty theft, for petty, petty, petty issues. And that we, mostly survivors, couldn't comprehend how something that stole our, our dignity, our humanity, could be downgraded so low. But slowly, some of us were dragged into it. Some of us did not consent to it initially. But, uh, and I was one of the uh, many who opposed it initially, who resented it initially. But I am one of many who actually celebrate Gachacha. Like I said, Gachacha was healing because as you sit in this room and everybody's gonna raise and speak, and sometimes you would lie. And when you lie, X person who was next to you would actually say that was not true. And the survivors are forced to sit there to not only uh, share what they might remember, but really to fight for the justice that took so long to come and sometimes never came. But there, there was a shared platform the Gachacha became a shared platform for pain from both sides. Because, you know, at least you would agree that even genocidal had their own emotional burdens to vent, to throw out. And some did not see Gachacha as an opportunity to be truthful. Uh, survivors sometimes uh, were victimized as a result of what they said or what they could say. There were the killings of survivors. Um, I was sharing with David. If uh, I, I, I can, uh, I have to double check, but I, I believe uh, around 2010, at least we had uh, on the record 136 survivors who were killed 
for having been vocal, for having shared what they had seen, uh, you know, during a chacha. So there was uh, that lack of protection. But then you ask yourself, if we are talking about people who live in New Haven, Tutsi and who to live in the same neighborhoods, what kind of protection are, are we realistically asking for? There is none. And that's the challenge of the genocide that, uh, you know, as uh, Taylor mentioned, we are still living. Because the reality is, in the case of Rwanda, Hutu and Tutsi and Twa are still living next to one another. And there is no way, as much as we want to blame whatever the international community, the, the, the government of Rwanda, there is really no realistic way of protecting you against every other neighbor around your house. So with that, the healing through Gachacha, uh, first and foremost, it allowed us to get the impossible justice. And I use the word impossible to mean it, it, there, there was no any other way to give justice to us. Justice was seen as something that we just couldn't even dare dreaming about. But we got not probably the justice what we hoped for, but then again, what really kind of justice can you give me for my father to come back? There is none. So in that way, genocide becomes impossible. And the intimacy of Gachacha complicates the issue because on my own family, we have Hutus. My own uh, uh, paternal uh, aunt was married to a Hutu. And you know some of his uh, uh, brother-in-laws were genocidal themselves. So how do you, how, what do you do? What kind of justice are we talking about? What do you bring to justice? So, but I think what we have accomplished through Gachacha, one, at least as a survivor would start, we have created this platform where survivors were relieved, as horrific the stories were, to learn how their people were killed. Survivors were relieved to find the remains of their people, and many people have been buried as a result of Gachacha. But I think this sharing of pain and anger and hatred actually has greatly contributed to the reconciliation that we talk about, to this renewed unity. Uh, we actually go outside Gachacha itself, so many other initiatives. There was an article actually yesterday I was sharing with Hosode of this priest who took Gachacha and said, look, this genocidal, when they leave, when they, are, when they become free, I don't want them to come in my parish and pretend to be normal Christian. No. As a priest, I have an obligation to test their faith and really see if they were apologetic, if they are apologetic. So he actually asked, he created a system where this genocidal in his neighborhood would ask for forgiveness through action. They would come to you. By force, you would turn around and find your, you know, your land uh, dug. You know, we're talking about farming. You would turn around and find your house reconstructed. And obviously, the initial reaction is, how dare you even stepping in my property? But obviously, who, that, who would mind that kind of help, especially knowing that the more than 360 survivors were under the age of 16. You know, more than 50% of survivors were under the age of 15. We were left with no parents, with no homes. So having that kind of, you know, um, apology is always welcome. But then you have to actually be in the normal state to accept and acknowledge that, oh, that's actually, that's a step forward. So we have moved forward, I'm sorry, I think I'm, taking too long. We have moved forward because of Gachacha in many ways. But we also have to recognize that up to this moment, there are still challenges. There are still survivors who get threatened because of what they said, even long after Gachacha is closed. I mean, two years after the, the Gachacha uh, uh, courts were closed. Uh, but I think overall, we have accomplished much more than we even imagined before the Gachacha courts. There's so much to there's so much to say more about Gachacha, and I think um, Yvette has has said so much that I'm actually going to move on to the second part of that question, and and I think this clip of two two and a half minutes will address 
um, in, in, in some ways, the second question. Um, and the lights, please. Sorry. This is the question of uh, healing, I think. The changes since the genocide. What changes have occurred since the 1994 genocide that will assure never again? Thank you, Joe. Uh, I think it's uh, important to realize that uh, we talk about hatred, but you know, we, I think hating is, is human. We, we, we can't pretend to like everybody that we have met. Um, for genocide to happen, it has to be more than just the hatred. You can hate someone, but it doesn't mean that you have to kill. So the, the way the genocide uh, was planned and executed, we have to recognize that the, this was, there was a process, there was a system in place that convinced people over three decades. There was not just a system to convince people that this group is so evil, evil enough to be eliminated. People were, uh, initiatives were created for those who were killed. And we talk about 
the waves of the, of, uh, of the killings, starting in 1959, uh, going to 1963, going to 1978, even going as early as, um, you know, 19, um, or as late as uh, 1992. Where, again, we had it from uh, uh, Dr. Kaufman, impunity and immunity. You kill and you take his home. You kill and you take his position. So education, Rwandans were educated to hate. And they used the churches, the holy places. They used the uh, education institution. They used the mothers and fathers. Everybody was involved. So to reverse that uh, genocide propaganda, it's going to take not just the same effort, but much, much more effort because it takes hundreds of you know uh, days to build a home. But you can just set fire, and everything would be in the ashes in the next two hours. So in the case of Rwanda, the reality is that. Every single policy, every single policy we have put in place as a government, the never again is at the heart of it. And we're talking about never again from within, before we look outside. Uh, and that is, you know, going back to, we talked about education as basic education, but really the way people interact. The way you look at your neighbor and the stories you tell your kids. And that's very challenging because it requires a change of the mindset. We looked, I grew up being defined as a Tutsi. People referred to me as a Tutsi before they called my name. How do we change that? In the way that as Rwandans, we can see ourselves as Rwandans. I don't think being Tutsi is criminal or being Hutu is criminal or being Twa is criminal. You can be black, you can be white. The problem becomes when you use your ethnicity for the, uh, obviously, the disadvantage of your, of the other, of the ones that you define as the other. So we talk about you know, economic transformation. Rwanda is really now praised uh, for different reasons. On the record, we have been growing our economy uh, in, you know, at the average rate of 8%, even when Wall Street was going under, even when I was a part of many who lost their career because Lehman was going under, Rwanda was, you know, uh, Rwanda's economy was growing. But that economic growth wouldn't be meaningful if it's not reflecting the unity that we have to fight for. So it's, it has become like forging unity is not luxury. It's, it's so essential to our survival. It's so crucial to our survival. And everything else, we talk about health. I mean, we have been praised as a nation that has fought malaria, that has increased the vaccination of children under, uh, under age six. We have, you know, we are making sure that now for those women who were raped, they can safely have kids and their, ki their children are HIV negative. So we have accomplished uh, uh, all, all of that, but every single one of the um, initiatives we take has to speak to the forging of the unity that we need in order to for, move forward from the, the genocide. So really, this need for unity is so crucial. And I think uh, everything else that we have achieved, Joe, economically, politically, and socially, is really, a, um, it should be like the highlight of our inner desire to be united, to protect what brings us together instead of, you know, uh, watering what separate, what divides us. Kansai, yeah. do you want to go next? You. I think she has said a lot. So for me personally, as a survivor, when you go through such um, terrible experience, um, it, it's not, it doesn't take, it's not like overnight that you can heal. Not everybody heal the same way, you know, faster. It takes a long time. I think even though we have progressed in a lot of ways and um, has many, many things she just uh, mentioned, but um, we still need to keep also helping heal, you know, the wounds that we carry because um, 
um, there, there are some of them who still really um, need the support. So I think, I think uh, the journey is well, so I'm, I'm so happy with the journey, but we still need to do a lot also to keep helping build the heart. So thank you. Um, I think because uh, we're talking at the policy level, obviously we have a representative here from the Rwandan embassy, so I think I'm going to turn this question um, over to somebody else who can speak to sort of the hearts and minds of, of a population. And I think um, maybe I can, in say, in opposition to, to what Yvette said, not necessarily opposition to policy, but in opposition to the idea that maybe we don't really know what's happening in the homes. Um, and, and this takes us back uh, to um, 1994, and I think evidences um, what was going on in the homes, um, even if it wasn't necessarily codified in policy. Um. Sorry, I can ask for the lights again. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. How has Rwanda changed, in your mind, socially, politically, economically, educationally? And I know this is a large question, so I'm going to see if we can make this as succinct as possible so we can get to all the questions before the end of the panel discussion. I think in terms of um, 
again changes. I, 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 it goes back to the question that uh, we just discussed. I think the biggest change has been the mindset. And uh, uh, just to clarify, if you talk about a nation, healing is a very personal journal, uh, uh, journey. And uh, Kosone and I were 14 years old. We were girls. I was in Kigali, she was in Kibuye. Her experience might have been different uh, from my experience. So um, when you look at Rwanda as a nation, every single person is looking at himself differently from the way we did. Now, um, and I really do appreciate people like Taylor who go in every village and talk to everybody who is willing to, to, to speak. Because the reality is, it has only been 20 years, and 50 years from now, we're still gonna be reliving the you know, tragedy that we're discussing here. So in terms of uh, how Rwanda um, have uh, moved forward, we have accomplished a lot. And when I say, I can't just talk about the national accomplishment without realizing that little girls like Kosore and I, who, who, who did not go to private schools, who did not come from wealthy families, were given the opportunities to actually be sitting at Yale talking to you in the languages that we're not born speaking. So when we talk about what Rwanda has become, looking at 1994, really for me, what's amazing, the equal opportunities to Rwandans. And the spirit that Rwandans came to embrace now uh, to believe that you can be who you choose to be. I always wanted to be a lawyer, but 12, my father reminded me that as a girl and as a Tutsi, I would never make it in uh, the country that we're living in. But I'm proud to say that I, I would speak to my kids and say, do you want to be a singer? Be a singer. You want to be an actress? Be an actress. Because the country you're in actually would allow you to achieve that. That said, the uh, wounds and the heaviness of uh, you know, this tragedy are still you know, on our shoulders. We, we move with them. It, it takes a long time, yeah, but we, we have been progressing a lot, so um, we, we, we are keeping healing, so it's a journey. What do you think is the, the biggest accomplishment that you've seen, or is it a collective? The, uh, you know, as a country itself, to see the things they have done so far, I am so amazed. That, that gives us a hope also as people to um, to keep uh, working hard on, on healing, but it takes um, for survival personally as a person. So for survivors individually, it takes. Um, it depends of how this you know this the life a person lives. So some of the people have lost everyone. So I'm one of the fortunate people who have at least a mom. So who or a sister that who survived with me. But there are some of them who don't even have the entire family. They it gone completely gone for those people um it takes a long time or also for women as i talk about women what happened to women as a rape you know which was used as a weapon for those of them they they as you can imagine it's really a pain that just can't go anywhere just like right away it's a pain that you have to heal you know slowly so there are so many changes in your life, and you can't live the same way you used to live. It takes a long time. But, um, and those who, you know, who have other disabilities beside having HIV positive, too. So those of them, too, it takes a long time. But, but I think that um, we need to keep also, you know, supporting them when you, you, you see you help some. You help them when they see them being helped. It helps them also to heal better and sooner. So I think that um, uh, it's uh, something that needs to keep happening, and I'm happy that it keeps happening. And someone like Taylor, who comes to the country and speak to them, it helps a lot when you get when someone comes to you and gives you a voice and be able to express that within yourself it's a relief it's um it's another sort of healing mm -hmm. so 
And I think that, um, I, I, I'm, you know, um, it's, um, I'm happy for what, what's happening. And we need to keep pushing and keep working on helping and to heal. <laughs> Thank you. I think when we speak of accomplishments, we often uh, want to simplify it into something that's fully good or fully bad. Or, and, it, and, and it's always, it's always the case in Rwanda that nothing is black and white, and that everything is shades of gray. And so if you look back to Gachacha and you see that here was a government that decided that rape was a first tier crime, well, that's an amazing thing that the country decided that rape is a high, a high crime that needs to be prosecuted as such, and yet simultaneously, it's a setback too, because you had people who wouldn't admit to 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 that um, to that crime, and so that shifted over time, and there were changes. Even when you look at the fact that Rwanda is a country of of repurposing, I say that because Gachacha, one of the things that it did was repurpose perpetrators, and they set them free after a term, and they're living in their communities and and are essentially repurposed beings. This is a this is like you know can be seen as as a phenomenal kind of idea that, that, and obviously it's an expedient idea, obviously it's a practical idea because you can't keep everybody in prison and you can't uh, continue on, particularly even with their families um, with, while, with while relatives are still in prison. So it was maybe a necessity, but simultaneously you have the rescapé who must live next to them. So is that justice? Is it just? Who pays the price for some of these accomplishments, some of these things that take us forward, but also take us back. And do we want to live in a society that says this is, you know, OK, we can accept that you committed this crime and we can move forward. So I think everything is shades of gray. And we just have to keep asking ourselves and reminding ourselves that nothing is black and white, an accomplishment or not. OK, thank you. As mentioned as a focal point for many investigative reports, Rwanda has been singled out for the advanced status for the role of women. How has this leadership role helped to rebuild Rwanda since 1994? I think women uh, being the backbone of every house really uh, have been uh, very uh, crucial in the efforts of Rwanda uh, since 1994. And we talk about the stories we tell our kids when we're home, uh, but also we talk about being raped uh, like Consoré, and realizing that you have to overlook your pain and extend your help to the children who are looking up to you for food. Uh, so women have made too much sacrifice that we can uh, describe, uh, primarily because uh, being the moms and being becoming all of a sudden the heads of many households in Rwanda, they just had no choice but forgetting their own pain and working to make sure that food was put on the table. And many times it was not necessary because they were turning to their kids because most of them uh, had lost their children, as you saw in the stories and you heard from us. But as a woman, even us, even myself and Console, we have raised ourselves as we were raising our siblings. So that role of a mom had forced us to actually really become overachievers. And the only difference in the case of Rwanda is that that overachievement is being recognized. But I truly think that even in the US, where it remains true that women are, are underpaid co compared to their male uh, counterparts, uh, women are still overachievers. The case of Rwanda is that we are just being recognized as underachievers. And obviously, we are operating in the system where uh, opportunities are created to encourage uh, you know, more women to take on leadership roles. And I think really that translates to the new face of Rwanda that we discussed, where girls, uh, unlike me, I played soccer because my dad was cool, but uh, many girls my age couldn't play soccer because it was for the boys. I could wear pants because my, my dad was encouraging, but more women were restricted to what they could or couldn't do, how they behaved or they couldn't. So all those limitations have been uplifted, uh, primarily because we are truly changing the way we see ourselves as Rwandans, but primarily the way we are seen as women by our own uh, society people, starting with men. Counselor? I give her that. 
Well, my question would be you, the it's, it's well known in Africa that the number of women serving in the parliament is the highest in all of Africa, if not the world. Also in the Supreme Court, somebody like Sylvia Kayatesi, who is known to be a great jurist as well as a human rights advocate. Uh, when you look at people like that, how can you, it seems like you're just saying, okay, that's just the way it is. To me, coming from Western looking here, that's quite an accomplishment. You've turned around a male-dominated society to make it somewhere where it's equality. No, definitely. I, I actually that's that's exactly what it is. So I'm totally not undermining what we have been able to do. I mean, I look at myself uh, coming from nowhere. I'm 34 years old, so I still represent the youth. Uh, I'm a female. I didn't go to Harvard and Yale. I didn't go to Keith and uh, Green Hills. I am an ordinary girl. A survivor who slept on the street. A survivor who went for days with no food. A survivor who begged for food on the street because, like I said, I lived among the killers for uh, more than three months. How did I become an advisor to the ambassador? It's not a miracle. It's simply because, you know, we are at the stage where people are truly being recognized. Uh, for doing things that they have been doing. So I think the women empowerment in Rwanda um, is real. It's not artificial. It's real because I believe that the future of Rwanda is my responsibility. I'm not looking for a man who is going to give me a name because I have one. And I have one, and my purpose of surviving is to making sure that my name counts. I, I happen to be among the few uh, from among the few families that have family names. I bear my father's name. It's not the Rwandan culture, but the Rwandan, um, the Rwandan culture actually attributes a lot of meaning to people's names. Your name defines who you are. So uh, your names become your identity. So when we talk about women being valued, I see myself and I want my kids to be known as my kids. I just don't want to be a child barrier who would be forgotten because my husband is Dr. So-and-so. I believe in getting that doctorate myself. And I am lucky to be in a country where the system is allowing me to grow just as fast as my brother is growing. So it's, it's really real. And it starts with the Constitution. It goes back to the same policy. He talked about some organizations that come and they give uh, the opportunities to some. And survivors, obviously, if you talk about, oh, I'm only going to give you loans because you have collateral, most survivors might not qualify. And that's unfair. But it's also true from the economic perspective that you need to do the investments uh, that are more likely to succeed. So how do you find a balance? And that's really a challenge. So it's good to, to keep in mind that we're discussing about Rwanda. Eh? Uh, we are not a perfect nation. We are not in a place where we, we think we should be, but at least we have made some progress and we're determined to keep going. And keep going means the wounded has to come along, the traumatized have to come along, the women have to come along, and the children all together have to be empowered. And we are only trying, but we are trying, and we have seen some uh, fruitation of the efforts. And I truly believe we can go further. Okay, we only have about five minutes left, and we'd like to see if we could take one or two questions from the audience. Um, there we go. Yes. Okay, Mike. Thanks, David. Perfect. Okay. Um, firstly, I just want to say thank you so much for coming here and for sharing your own stories. It's been very, very powerful um, for me and I'm sure for everyone here to hear you speak so briefly and so courageously. Um, I was struck by uh, your statement uh, in the beginning and you said that when you meet people and you tell them I'm from Rwanda, the first thing everyone thinks is, oh, <laughs> that, that, that country. And so that's the first story that anyone would think of. So I want to know um, what, what you hope people will think. I mean, you've been discussing this, but when you meet someone and say, I'm from Rwanda, what do you want people to imagine? Maybe if we're not here today, what do you want them to imagine 10 years from now? And so forth. Thank you. 
Before, wait, so before you answer that, let me take a, a second question. We can lump them together in twos. Thank you. Uh, truly, I appreciate your uh, courage too. But I just want to ask that the, the usual uh, continuity that the government maintains in Africa, what do you think will happen to Rwanda if there is a change? For somebody to be in power for so long, it seems to be a pattern that we might want to see what happens if there is a change. And is that likely to be soon? Thank you. Councilor, do you want to take the first one and then you want to take the second one? <laughs> um, I think you have to understand. It really takes Console. I've known her since 2007. It really takes her a lot of effort to share her story. And I, I, having seen the transformation since the very first day I saw her speak, and the way she speaks now, I can really appreciate even being still able to sit and smile. She used to shake, she used to cry. So I, I just want you guys to know that it's just a blessing really to see Console at this stage, you know? Uh, so I'm, she has a lot to share, I, um, but I, can, I know what it takes to go through these stories and I can only imagine what it takes her knowing the cross that she carries. Okay. <laughs> So uh, going back to the question, what do I wish Rwanda would be uh, you know, known for other than the genocide? Women empowerment. What do I wish Rwanda can be known for? Rwanda has always been known as an, a country of thousand hills. It's actually a very beautiful greenery left and right, north to south. But also the people of Rwanda, for people like Joe, like uh, you know David, like Zach, obviously I skipped Taylor since uh, he's my buddy here. But everybody who goes to Rwanda, I've met a number of people who actually told me they have worked in Rwanda, they lived in Rwanda. It's a beautiful nation. And Rwandans, believe it or not, including the killers, are warm people. They are they are, I'm, so, I'm sorry to say, they're welcoming people. So uh, the fact that this spirit that we're here to celebrate, the, the reason why I believe that we actually can preserve it and keep it burning is because I believe that even those who killed, even those who killed can still be forgiven and come back and contribute to a peaceful world. Uh, Taylor talked about the challenges of these people going back to the villages. Yes, these are the people that I'm talking about. Yes, they have really touched blood in cruel ways, but I totally believe that their human spirit is still there and can be nurtured well enough for these people to actually come back and be teachers to our kids and be able to convey a positive message. I, I, I happen not to believe, and uh, I, I hear, um, I really allow myself to remove my uh, uh, political heart since sometimes people go like, is she a survivor or is she a politician? Well, I'm a diplomat, actually. I'm not even a politician. But I, I, you know, sometimes people might think that what I say is what the government want me to say, and it's a part of my job. But uh, you know, it's, it's true that if the genocide is not well taught, I, as a person, am lost. If the genocide is not so well understood, I forget who I am. And this is why this issue of denial is serious. So in the case of Rwanda, genocide was a, such a big part of our history. We have to embrace it and accept it. It's a heavy cross that we're gonna carry around until I don't know when. It's a history that we must preserve. But it's also true that we have offered so much more than that. We have offered, you know, we have shown to the world that it doesn't matter how low you can sink, you can still come back. So, you know, and the, it translates to the next question, uh, which was about, yes, we are here celebrating Rwanda, but do we see this progress as something that would continue after the leadership changes? I believe so. And I believe so because I am here not as a puppet. I am not a decoration. I am here because I have a brain 
that has got me where I am. I did not get this job because I'm so and so. I got a job that I deserve. And when I am up at 3 a.m., it's not because my boss is on my back. It's because I'm serving a nation that I believe has to thrive past President Kagame, past my time when my time comes, and past any other president who would come. Because I came to understand, as I was sitting in that um, house, uh, hiding, pretending to be Hutu, or moving around the streets, pretending to be Hutu to survive, I was wondering where was the international community. I was wondering why no one cared. Because I thought it was the international community's responsibility to stop the genocide. And soon I learned that only Rwandan picked up their little, little small guns and actually soldiered on until the genocide was stopped. And they taught me one thing, the future of Rwanda is here. I hold it, and when I drop it, it is gone. So the president of Rwanda has been a leader to celebrate. But if past him, Rwanda goes, will go back, then he's not the president that I am here to celebrate. I celebrate him because I have seen him empowering people, starting with Consode, despite the HIV, despite the rape, the rape that she endured, despite my own uh, baggages that I carry around, I am empowered and I see myself as an individual with a future. And that's something you can translate from these women on the video from north to the south. And the trauma, we still carry it, but we carry it in a way that would actually be constructive. Um, I'll just say briefly, the, what do I dream for? Um, certainly there are things that I think are uh, nearly impossible. Some of these things include uh, bringing finally the high level genocidaires who are still at large in countries like Belgium um, and around the world uh, to justice, and also things like reparations and restitution for the rescapé in Rwanda. Um, certainly, these things may be unattainable, but I still dream for them. I also, you ask a question about the next president and, and, and when there may be a transition, and I think today we may be witnessing the launching of the, of, of the next campaign for president, uh, and, and, and we may get to see Yvette become president soon. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Oh, oh, dude, I'm sorry, I didn't see you go answer. But, no, no, go ahead. Okay. They have said it well, so I dream the same thing. I, I, I dream to see the healing keep happening to everyone in the country, especially for survivors. And um, yeah, to see every, because I see the future bright because the survivors are more are also involved in in helping. So in the uh, uh, I keep you know I have I keep looking forward to every good thing. So yeah, I, I think um, although I'd love to continue this this panel, we don't have all night, and uh, I think that is actually. Um, a, a poignant, lovely and poignant note from all three uh, panelists on which to end, uh, so we will. So I'd like to first uh, extend my thanks uh, to Joe, uh, Yvette, uh, Taylor, and Consolé, uh, uh, as well as the earlier panel, uh, for participating. We may. Uh, but before we go, I would like to uh, add for uh, for posterity and out of the uh, uh, the, the uh, depth of my heart, a thanks not just to all the speakers and the the um, uh, participants, as, but also to, once again to the uh, the sponsors of this event, uh, including the Macmillan Center and the Kemp Fund, which made this uh, uh, this event possible. Uh, a number of people in Macmillan administration have been instrumental in, in working uh, on, uh, on putting this together. Joy Sherman, Maureen Anderson, Chris Musiker, uh, Barbara Mianzo, uh, Mianzo from uh, the Shell Center. Uh, the production staff, uh, Aaron and Jamie upstairs, uh, have kept us going when uh, we were perhaps about uh, to, to run aground. 
Uh, Denise Lim uh, has, been, uh, has been quite a help, uh, and especially uh, Cecilia Cruz, who helped uh, uh, in numerous ways preparing for this event. So thank you, thank you all, thank all of you. Uh, I hope this has been a thought-provoking uh, afternoon, and I'm really glad that you chose to spend it with you. Uh, so I will only say now, go in peace. Thanks.